Welcome to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. In this podcast, we break down high profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning stories, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their cores very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. We actually have two guests today for the first time. We have Rob Wormuth and Kevin Donahue. Rob is a senior partner with Pennsylvania-based firm Legacy Planning. He specializes in documenting goals and developing strategies for significant life events, including corporate succession planning, estate planning, and establishing or managing a family foundation. Kevin is a partner also at Legacy Planning Partners who specializes in helping families with complicated finances organize their affairs, document their goals, and identify strategies to help them reach these goals more effectively. Thanks for coming on the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So the subject of today's episode is Playboy Magazine founder and figurehead Hugh Hefner. Now, if you told me the details of Hugh Hefner's life, you know, legendary Lothario, multiple marriages, much younger girlfriends, living deep into old age, etc., and then asked me to predict what his estate would look like, I probably would have offered some disaster scenario. And I would have been wrong. Hefner's estate was complex and well-considered. In September 2017, when Hefner passed away at age 91, according to Fortune.com, he was only worth some $35 million, which is surprising. That being said, astute listeners of the show know better than to be fooled by a number like that, as we also know for a fact that Hefner had multiple trusts, which were just a small portion of these robust estate planning during life. In 2011, Hefner partnered with a private equity group to purchase his Playboy stock and take the company back private for a total package worth $207 million. When the dust cleared, Hefner ended up with a 37% ownership interest in the new company, along with an employment contract that paid him $1 million per year, gave him an editorial control over the Playboy brand and the right to live in the mansion, practically rent-free for the rest of his life. Now, Hefner even had the foresight to protect what he had left through a prenuptial agreement with his third wife, Crystal Harris, whom he read in 2012. Reportedly, the prenup provided Harris with $5 million plus a house, which cost another $5 million, that Hefner purchased for her and transferred to a trust that Harris controlled. So who actually inherited his money? Well, Crystal and his four children, Christy, David, Marson, and Cooper, divided the money amongst themselves with one catch. Hefner dictated that any beneficiary of the trust will waive their rights to the money if there is evidence of substance abuse for a prolonged period. Now, when somebody remarries later in life, trouble generally follows. Yet Harris, who was age 31, and Hefner's four children, who ranged in age from 26 to 64, appear to be a happy exception to the rule. In fact, the family's view of Harris turned from initial skepticism to gratitude, and they even commended her on how she took care of Hefner in his time of need as he uh, neared the end of his life. But what about the famous Playboy Mansion? Well, in 2016, the mansion was sold to neighbor Darren Mitropoulos for $100 million. The downside to that deal, of course, is that Hefner didn't receive any of that money because he no longer owned the house due to the transaction of him selling the Playboy empire that we talked about just moments ago. But there was a significant upside too. Playboy Enterprise paid 1 million per year back to Metropolis so that Hefner could live in the mansion so they effectively paid his rent. So Rob, there's a virtual smorgasbord of estate planning topics we could talk about here, but let's start with this one. One of the most interesting aspects of Hugh Hefner's plan is how much of his estate he got in order through transactions made during his life from arranging the sale of the house to prenups and intervivos trusts. Do you mind expanding on the advantages of making estate planning focused transactions during life and maybe offer some best practices for advisors to try and incorporate these concepts with their own clients? Great, David, sure. 
Well, Mr. Hefner's estate was really well planned and credit would certainly go to Mr. Hefner, but also to his team and potentially to his family for how they communicated together and how they were able to, to work through all this complicated uh, changes through his life with different marriages and children with a, a, a huge range in age upon his death. In the estate planning transaction side of things, we see business owners that are taking an asset that they believe is going to appreciate greatly and try to find ways with their estate planning team to remove those appreciating assets from the estate. Whether that's to benefit a child or a spouse or a former spouse, uh, that's still a wonderful tool or technique. And we would suspect that Mr. Hefner's estate was quite larger than we see in the numbers that you discussed earlier. Besides the uh, transitioning of business assets, which there's several different ways in which families do that, we also see in blended families, when there's a new spouse on the scene, there is also another uh, estate credit. At the time of Mr. Hefner's death, the estate tax credit was $5.49 million in 2017. In 2018, that doubled, but it seems like a quite low credit in comparison to today's number of 11.7 million. So it's quite possible with the new spouse in the scenes that his advisor team could have discussed potentially um, working with Crystal through gifting and then a subsequent gift, not a step transaction, but some different ways in which you could trans, uh, transfer additional assets or additional growth assets out of the estate. There's really many, many different tools or techniques that families use. And it seems to me that Mr. Hefner and his planning team did deploy a lot of them. Yeah, I'd uh, like to apologize. I'm sure everyone can hear our th now third guest, which is my cat Percy meowing in the background here. Please uh, welcome <laughs> Percy to the show. But uh, so, you know, one of the aspects we talked about here, one of the, the main aspects of this estate, um, that, that's very common regardless of whether your clients are sort of billionaires or just regular folks, is, is, the, is the family business. And that, that's often um, the center of a lot of controversy and sort of the center of an estate plan for better or worse. Um, here, Hefner sort of, you know, the, the advantage of doing it during life is that he has made very clear what he wanted done with this business and sort of sort of sidestepped a lot of the fighting over instead of like leaving different chunks of it uh, to the children. Kevin, what are some of the other ways that, you know, that you can sort of plan around having a, a family business in the state to try to avoid the sort of conflicts that we see come up often? Well, from a practical standpoint, it's clear that Mr. Hefner knew what he wanted and communicated that to his children and those closest to him and, and definitely do his advisor team. And that's oftentimes the most challenging part is helping clients really understand what they want, define it. Because once you can define it, then, then executing becomes much easier. So the, a huge amount of credit goes to him in knowing what he wanted and having clarity on his own before then going to his team. And it looks like that might've been the case because Otherwise, I don't know that he would have had such a clean and efficient estate plan. But some of the, some of the strategies we help clients uh, envision early on, and you know, another aspect of why doing this planning during your life is so much more impactful, to Rob's point, is that power of compounding you know, works from an estate planning standpoint. And the more efficient and better you are during your life doing it, the goal is to, uh, to not die with a hundred, 200, 300 million dollar estate. Uh, and as you pointed out, David, the chances are his assets were four five and six X when you take into account all the other entities or trusts uh, that had wealth that he had generated. But as it relates to the family business, you know, some things as simple as uh, recapitalizing the company so that you have non-voting and voting shares and you're, you're then, uh, it's easier for the donor, in this case, Mr. Hefner, if it wasn't a public company, he can give away more shares and not worry about losing control. For so many clients we work with, with private family businesses, there is a control concern. So giving away non-voting shares, uh, there's a little bit more of a discount they can get, which leads to more efficient estate planning, but then they can maintain control. Uh, so that, that's one uh, for the smaller businesses 
were privately held businesses that we're talking about. And as he took the company public with that private equity firm uh, before he passed, they may have had an ability to do more of that planning. Beyond that, you then have the ability to leverage. So when these families, when you give assets into a trust or outside of your estate, those trusts can then leverage and borrow and, and buy more assets from Mr. Hefner's estate in this case. So if you have a trust and it has a million dollars of assets, that trust can come back to Mr. Hefner and buy another million dollars of stock. And in many cases, $9 million of stock from him, which leads to Rob's point of getting more assets out earlier and allowing the, the appreciation of those assets to reside outside of the estate and escape estate taxes. So I, I am guessing uh, from the looks of it that a lot of those tactics and leverage and control issues were addressed in his planning. I'm really glad that you touched on, especially this idea of voting and non-voting shares of stocks um, and, and sort of you know, playing around with the discounts because um, just because there's, there's another very high profile celebrity situation, you know, estate planning snafu that happened fairly recently with you know, Bill Davidson, who's the uh, owner of the Detroit Red Wings and the Orlando sports teams, he met the Magic and the Light and the Tampa Bay Lightning, and he did a similar thing where he, you know, he divided his his shares into voting and non-voting, and then he got a little too aggressive in terms of trying to discount those shares using self-canceling installment notes and all sorts of scary estate planning stuff that's a little beyond the, the scope of what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. But um, he ended up with you know a, a huge tax fight with the IRS, knowing tens of millions of dollars. So it's it just really reinforces that you know these are techniques that anyone can use, even if you're not a billionaire. But it's always important to involve either an attorney or someone who is experienced in doing them, because it's not a free roll, right? There's always some poor aspects of these that need to be done properly, otherwise they can really blow up in your face. That is so true, uh, David. It's really it's it's unbelievably true. We think that you know planning really revolves around the team planning and sitting back in front of the client and the family and communicating uh, the plans and the objectives to the family at their different levels. We spend a lot of time with, you know, we hear over and over again, moms and dads need to talk to their kids more, needs to communicate to their children more. We find is that that's just not happening. And it does it does really well, but it's a very small subset of society, especially super successful families and business owners, because there's so much to talk to our kids about. We've had great success, and I know many of our industry have, in um, having agendas for the kids' education, the bottom up in high school and in college and in their 20s and 30s to try to teach some of the basics, and the top down teaching some of the basics uh, to those children about how they hold a team accountable how they sit in front of a a group of accountants and attorneys and trust officers and money managers and know that we're not there to be friends and have tea, but to make sure that everyone's working in the smartest way possible to support the family and to support the the person or the family, the mom and dad that generate all those funds to begin with. So I think that planning and communication followed by, of course, documentation and the detail over and over again, we read about the details. They didn't change the beneficiary on a life insurance policy. The titling of the asset was never transferred to the revocable trust. And so understanding the details from top to bottom, um, understanding the importance of documentation and keeping a record of those documents, understanding that the kids need support and education and doing that support and education not just with the senior attorney or the senior uh, accountant or advisor, but to have a a plan and oftentimes try to match that communication plan with the proper age. If we have a 32 year old child, let's try to find someone within a decade of their age to communicate and listen. Because oftentimes you, you separate the core advisor team from the children and you put somebody in the middle, boy, those children will speak a lot more openly when there's somebody different at the table. So it just improves the outcome. Yeah, I and mean, this idea of the importance of communication is something that we talk about just basically every episode on this show, because it's just unavoidable and it's that important. Um, and it's something that I worry that people, you know, listeners sometimes roll their eyes at, because it's like, oh, talk to your kids, you know, thanks doctor, that should be so hard. 
but you know ironically it is you know it, it, it's getting harder and harder that you think that today we have more and more tools to communicate with and yet I think it, you know most experts will tell you that people are communicating even less than they were before because we have you know families are getting more complex right we have people are living longer they're getting married more often they're getting divorced more often families are becoming increasingly blended and so there's just more and more barriers just so as many barriers are being removed by you know technology and the internet and, and all the ways we can reach out to one another there's other barriers replacing them in that oh, well, I don't know my stepbrothers at all, you know, or I have, I have three half brothers who I never see, you know, and there's, there's all of these complicating factors when we say like, oh, just talk to your kids. You know, it's a lot more than that. It's not, it's not just that easy. Yeah, it's not for sure. And, and the longer you put it off, especially in the blended families, what we find is when mom and the new boyfriend or dad and the new girlfriend start dating and then they decide to get married, Oftentimes, they still have not had the conversation about finances. Mm -hmm. And there is an assumption on the, the less wealthy of the two that they're going to get half. And, and it's remarkable how consistent that assumption has been in our experience. So early on, any one of our clients who is flirting with or starting a relationship, we're, we're the anti-romantic <laughs> saying, listen... <laughs> we're, we're begging you just you have to start planting the seed you have to start being comfortable talking about it because the longer you put it off it becomes an enormous rock that you just can't get around and let alone with the kids the same goes for the kids and it looks like Mr. Hefner did a remarkable job of making sure they knew what he wanted and that he told them and not only that the other thing that, that seems to be the case with him is that he was in control and no one ever doubted it. And we have some clients as they get older, the kids kind of take control. And, and you may have seen this in your life and in our life. Sometimes our parents, it's a flip-flop, but it's their money, it's their assets. And, and it's important for our clients to remember it is their decision and they should not. And too often they get sometimes, I don't know if manipulated isn't the right word, but they're influenced by the kids' emotional reactions, and it, it really makes everything worse. So the earlier communication can be had, the more direct it can be, and the more we can help do that, which Rob, to his credit, throughout our career, he has really trumpeted the importance of putting us in the middle. Let us be. If you're not comfortable doing it, let us do it. And, um, and it really pays dividends over mm -hmm. time. And, you know, I'm, I think you know, Hugh Hefner, again, you know, deserve special credit for this because, you know, we're talking about large age differences. A lot of times you're talking about kids and I always laugh at this on the show that, you know, well, quote unquote kids, but you know, one of the kids here is 64 and you know, this, this is not a child, you know, and what, and you're, so we're saying, Oh, talk to your kids. Well, one of these kids in, in the Hefner's case, the oldest was 64 and the youngest was 26. Those are very different conversations you're having. This is, it's a 40 year age gap between the oldest and the youngest child. And that's while that's extreme, yeah, that has to be taken into account, right? And you can't sit all those kids down in one room and have the same talk with them. You know, David, we've had great success with, with speaking to kids as a group. Really? Uh, what we found from it over and over again is the kids learn from each other. You know, if you're sitting there with, with uh, four kids, two of them are going to answer the questions and two of them are going to listen intently to their answers. And they may be, there may be a piece emotional in there, uh, but there's also a lot of um, leadership. And we have countless examples with working with families from high school and college and picking their first apartment and buying their first home where we bring the kids together with some basic information or education. And it's, it's repeatedly, we hang up the phone and say, Sally learned more from Joan or the brother or the sister, they learn more from each other and what they've learned or read or the podcast they've done. And it's been fantastic. Now, it does not mean or negate the fact that one-on-one -on -one education has to be had, um, but children of wealthy families are, their education has to be different. It has to be purposeful. It has to be building blocks one on top of the other. And we work very hard on, uh, on that baseline and up to build that. And I know a lot in our industry do. 
I think the other part is that oftentimes post mom and dad, there's this wake up call. It's the first meeting that a lot of families have had or the kids have had, or even the spouse that's not the financial spouse has had with the advisor team. And it just can't be that way. So that um, uh, educating the kids along the way, it doesn't mean to show them all the zeros or what the company, the house is worth, but it does mean we need to start to let them understand what the legalities of a trust would look like or what their role would be or what their strength would be versus their weakness and why they have to be aware of, uh, uh, of maybe a fee or a tax strategy or a, um, a team member. I think uh, this idea of that like a little bit can go a long way and that things like education can, can snowball and, and sort of do more. The end result can end up producing more results than sort of the initial work put in a lot of the time. It's something that's true across an estate plan, right? Where like, I love the idea that you said that sort of, you know, you can teach, be talking to all three kids, but then, you know, the younger is going to look at the older and learn maybe more from them or maybe learn things, other things from them now that you hadn't even included in the lesson, but just naturally sort of arose in during, you know, the course of their relationship and now talking about these things that you started. And I think, you know, on the technical side of things, it's easy to look at estates and they're like, oh my God, there's so many details that you can forget. I believe, I believe it was Kevin who mentioned, you know, uh, beneficiaries on a life insurance policy earlier in the conversation. And so keeping track of stuff like that can seem crazy. But once you bring up the idea of, oh, I have a life insurance policy. Oh, let's take a look at that. Other, who's the beneficiary? Oh, look, we didn't make a beneficiary. Let's do that. And also now we're thinking about it. Do I have any other policies that have beneficiary designations? Maybe I should check to make sure those are okay. And so just from the question of like, oh, I have a life insurance policy you should know about. Now you've gotten into snowballed into this different, you know, a state that's getting into the, the corners and stuff that normally maybe people wouldn't think about. Uh, yeah, David, we, we, um, we pride ourselves on detail. And again, I'll give this, this, Rob built this early on. When our clients start working with their estate plan. So we have a call uh, next week. I have a call with a client who's newly minted 50 plus millionaire. And they, they have an estate plan now. But that estate plan was based on a three or four million dollar estate 12 years ago. And, and we revisit it every year. But now over the last 24 months, everything's changed. And they finally have the time to tackle the estate plan. Well, I've had a pre-call with the attorney already. And the attorney knows every nook and cranny of their estate. They know every insurance policy, every retirement account, every beneficiary. And that's record keeping on our end, right? So for folks out there, a record keeping component, a team, a team member who's keeping those records and knows every aspect of your world. It helps so much when you walk into the attorney's office and you've got it laid out. Because what happens is the client walks in, especially if they're a complicated, wealthy client, they just don't have the time to put all that together. And their attorney or their accountant typically don't have those details. And their investment advisor typically knows where some of the investment accounts are. So it's rare where 100% of it is captured clearly and succinctly. And so that, that's something that if you don't have that role in your team, you, you got to fill that role because those details all of a sudden become in critically important 10 and 15 years from yeah. now. This idea of, you know, we're, we're stressing having these conversations early because effectively these conversations once started are never going to end because we're fighting against an enemy that can't lose effectively, right? We're, we're fighting against time who always wins. And then we're just trying to sort of mitigate the damage to an estate. So like you said, you know, the estate made 15 years ago may have been just wonderfully planned, but 15 years has a way of just completely destroying your wonderful plan if you just let it sit there. So it really is, you know, these conversations need to start because they need to keep happening indefinitely effectively, which sounds scary, but is easier and, and less scary once you start doing it. Rob, if I'll, you know, one, one thing we've instituted, and again, Rob really drives this, is with team meetings. And there's an annual calendar that these clients, all these families want to have it. And it looks like Mr. Hefner had it. By all accounts, what we're seeing is it was a constant part of his annual checklist of minding his home was he had planning meetings probably quarterly or semi-annually with his team. And this team was clearly some attorneys, probably some tax advisors and his wealth advisors. And so that, that has to become part of your every year rhythm. 
it's, it's like going to the dentist. Um, and in many ways, more, <laughs> far more important. And, and that's the rhythm. These fa- I think you take a lesson like that from Mr. Hefner's estate. It looks like he did that. Well, folks, that's about all the time we have for today. Unfortunately, this is, if you have new state, it's, it's always nice to see one on this show where we're not talking about a disaster for once. And we can actually, instead of saying, don't do this, we can point to saying something that is well done. Um, I think that, you know, Rob and Kevin really have done a very nice job of, of sort of expanding on some very complex topics, but at least for once positive topics on this show that, that advisors can really sink their teeth into. So I'd love to thank you know, Robert Wormuth and Kevin Donahue for being fantastic guests, guys. Thank you for coming on. Thanks very much, David. Thanks, David. And for all the listeners, I'll see you, or I guess you'll hear me on the next episode of Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. 